So I think, as everybody knows, um, our history theme for 2019 is schooling in Norwich. And um, how appropriate is it that we've been able to invite Steve Taylor here this afternoon to talk to us um, about um, one-room schoolhouses in New England? Um, some of you perhaps know that Steve has done this program uh, around the Upper Valley and probably other parts of New Hampshire um, over the years. And we're very pleased to welcome Steve with us today. Um, Steve Taylor is an independent scholar, uh, farmer, journalist. Um, Steve worked at the Portsmouth Herald, and many of you may remember him as the managing editor for the Valley News for, I'm not sure how many years, three, four, eight, eight years as managing editor of the Valley News. Um, and Steve is a longtime public official. He served as the um, Secretary of Agriculture for the state of New Hampshire for, I think, 25 years. Um, with his sons, um, Steve has operated a dairy. Dairy apparently is now closed, but still uh, a cheese-making operation and a sugar-making operation, as I understand. Um, down in Meriden, Meriden Village. So Steve's been a newspaper reporter and editor, um, and he was also the founding executive director of the New Hampshire Humanities Council, which I was actually not aware of until I read this biography. Um, and uh, obviously, Steve has been a lifelong student of the rural culture of New Hampshire and northern New England more generally. So without further ado, please welcome Steve Taylor. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come to Norwich uh, today, a lovely day, and I'm so impressed with all your many, many accomplishments as a, a historical society. I think you were smart to keep that, uh, that name. Uh, I don't know, historical center or whatever, just doesn't, doesn't carry it, I don't think. Um, anyway, I always have to start off when I hear this thing about independent scholar. I'll tell you how that came about. I mean, it's a preposterous term. Uh, I, uh, I had retired from state service and uh, was home working on the farm with my sons for a couple of years. And one day I got a call from the State Humanities Council people. Uh, they said, well, as you should, you probably know, we have a stable of presenters that travels around the state doing lectures on various topics uh, uh, with at least some connection to the humanities. And um, uh, we're a little thin on agricultural history and rural life. How about it, would you be willing to do a talk along that line, perhaps? And I said, well, yeah, I think I could do that. And they said, well, fine. Uh, we'll send you some paperwork that you need to fill out, and then you'll have to have an audition. Uh, <laughs> well, the paper came, and I sat down to fill it out. This is a fairly elaborate document. And I got to the line that said, what is your terminal degree? I said, oh, oh, I said, I don't have a PhD, I don't have a master's, I barely got my bachelor's degree, uh, and so I laid it aside. Clearly, I'm not qualified, and uh, 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 almost forgot about it. Well, a couple of weeks went by, and, uh, and the gentleman from the Humanities Council called and said, where's that paperwork? We've got to have it right off. And I said, gee, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm qualified. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't have that terminal degree you're looking for. He said, ah, don't worry. We'll call you an independent scholar. <laughs> so here I am today as an independent scholar. Um, I wanted to explain that I do have some well, very thin uh, roots here in, in Norwich. First of all, I went to Hanover High School. And uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to have in my class very distinguished gentleman. His name is William Aldrich. Uh, and he's right over there. Uh, uh, you, he won't tell you, but you should know that at the 50th reunion of the class of 1956, he was voted the best preserved. <laughs> uh, now, the other, uh, the other connection is, uh, is this. Uh, 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 my grandfather was Robert Longley Taylor, 
and he was a professor of Romance Languages at Dartmouth College. And he owned a farm up on, uh, you call it Elm Street, uh, as I understand it, the people who own it now are uh, named Stetson, a big brick house, and it had a big barns in back of it and so on. And my father was born there in 1910. And uh, uh, Professor Taylor uh, was something of a legend at Dartmouth for one rather unfortunate thing. He walked to class, and he would go down through uh, the covered bridge, Ledyard Bridge. And on one particular day, he had an encounter with a skunk. <laughs> or rather than go home and change his clothes and clean up, he went on and taught class. <laughs> and he was known ever after at Dartmouth as Skunk Taylor. <laughs> well, he, he, he decamped to Williams College to be a dean later on. And, uh, uh, the, 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 the skunk tailor uh, uh, whole thing kind of got lost in the mists of time, fortunately. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, uh, anyway, as I said, it's great to be here and, and to talk with you. And uh, uh, th this talk I, I put together for the Humanities Council, uh, and, and I've done it all over the state of New Hampshire. I don't know how many times. Uh, always fun to do because there are still people in the audience who attended one-room schools and occasionally somebody who taught in a one-room school is there to talk, uh, to tell their story and join in with me. And so it's great fun to do it. But uh, I titled it uh, The Romance and the Reality. And uh, uh, I have to tell you, first of all, that I am a product of a one-room school, although only for one year. Uh, I started at the Tracy School in Cornish in uh, September of 1945. Uh, at the time, Plainfield, where I lived in Cornish, uh, had all one-room schools, and they used to kind of swap enrollment a little bit along the town line for kids who lived near a, a school in the other town. It was okay, but it all evened out. Uh, the Tracy School, from the place where I lived in Plainfield, was about a half a mile away. We could see the building from, from our front step. So I started out at the Tracy School, a one-room school with 23 pupils. There were three of us in the first grade. Dora Perry and Martha Archibald and I started out, and I kept in touch with those two women. Uh, throughout their lives, they both passed on, but we really had a bond as a result of, of starting off together in that little school. We had a marvelous teacher. Her name was Eva Hill Bernard. And Eva Hill Bernard, in the course of her career, would teach for 58 years in the one-room schools of Cornish and Plainfield. Uh, she started as a teacher after attending Kimball Union Academy for two years. At the age of 16, she taught. And she was a marvelous teacher. And how in the world could you run an eight-grade room uh, effectively. Well, she was, she was very innovative. She had all kinds of wonderful ideas, and she knew how to make it work. And she had the eighth grade girls help the first graders with their ABCs, and the second graders with their numbers would be helped by the seventh grade girls. The eighth grade boys kept the fire going in the big box stove in the middle of the room, and the seventh grade boys were tired with fetching water. And they would go down the hill with a bucket to the farm there and get a, go in the milk room and draw a bucket of water and bring it back and pour it in this big crock that sat on a table over in the corner. Now, uh, this being uh, still wartime, really rationing, so there were no Dixie cups, there were no solo cups, all right? So we were all issued a little square of wax paper, and we were taught how to fold that in such a way as to form a little cup. And I'll tell you, I have forever since tried to do that. Take, just take a, a piece of paper and fold it up and have it come out like that little cup. And I never, never can do it. And I spoke about this at various talks, and somebody will always come up, here, look how you do it. Grab a piece of paper. Here, look, that's how you do it. Still can't do it. Anyway, uh, uh, so, uh, but the thing I remember best about Eva Hill Bernard's class was this something called the Good English Club. She would stand around on the playground during recess with a notepad and a pencil. And if she heard bad usage, bad grammar, uh, she would make a note of it, all right? 
And at one o'clock on Friday, every week, the Good English Club would be called to order. Mrs. Bernard might say, Stevie Taylor, you'd stand beside your desk. Yes, Mrs. Bernard. She said, I heard you say, I ain't got my coat today. What should you have said? Mrs. Bernard, I, I should have said, I don't have my coat today. All right, you may sit down. No, you'll never forget a lesson like that. I mean, just incredible. <laughs> uh, so we started off with, uh, with, with good, solid grounding. But anyway, uh, after that first year, I was reassigned to the Plainfield Village School, which was a two-room school. And they had the first four grades in one room and the fifth through the eighth in the other. The only difference between that school, other than two, having two rooms, uh, and the Tracy School was that it had a flush toilet, all right, and central heat. So that was, a, otherwise it was, you know, multi-graded and uh, it required teacher to be quite innovative and, and uh, really, I would have to say, kind of courageous to, to, to face the challenge of dealing with a multi-grade environment like that. It's quite a thing. Well, anyway, when I started putting together this talk, uh, I had kind of a rough hope. Because I went to the New Hampshire State Library expecting to find voluminous material about the one-room school. Well, uh, not so. The reference librarian worked with me for over two hours. There was stuff that, you know, some numerical stuff and, and references to old registers and that kind of thing, but nothing narrative, you know, that would really help me get, get my, uh, my facts organized. And so he said, well, go over to the Historical Society. Bet they can help you. Got over there, same thing. They said, uh, we don't have much on that. Uh, why don't your best bet is to go to the towns and grab their town histories and read them, uh, look at their old town reports, look at old records. Well, that's exactly where I went. And that, with the oral tradition, is how I put together this talk. And, uh, and I'm certain that this is the same case in Vermont uh, and the other, uh, other New England states. So what I'm focusing on today is the period from about 1880 to 1920. That would be the period when we had the the, the most one-room district schools, that would be the summit years, the peak, and then the rapid decline, the closing, a widespread disappearance of these institutions. And uh, so it all really in a, in a span of 40 years, uh, really a tremendous change, very rapid as a consequence of that, which I'll talk about. Uh, and, uh, and I've always titled this uh, the, the Romance and the Reality. Now, the romance uh, is, is, grew, uh, is grounded, really, in a, a very noble thing. It was an attempt to educate everybody. And it began in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the, in the 1620s and 30s, where they said that there will be in each town a place for children to learn to read and write. And this is a radical, radical concept because back in the British Isles where most of these people came from, only the nobility, the royalty, the very well-to-do would afford their children the opportunity to learn to read and write and do simple arithmetic. The masses were just left to fend for themselves. But here, they said everybody needs to provide that, uh, be provided with that opportunity. And so that idea took hold in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and it spread northward. Our first reference in colonial New Hampshire is around 1634 to the concept of having each community, each town, have a place for education of children and also to employ the tax power to support it. And that in itself is a radical concept, to use public resources to fund, not simply have somebody build a building and, and have a school, but to have uh, all of the community support it through the tax. And that idea spread. And it became really a New England thing. And Vermont copied it, and uh, Maine copied it, and Connecticut and Rhode Island. You go to the American South, that did not happen. Of course, they're very, very concerned that the Negroes not be afforded any kind of education. If you want to read a wonderful new American history, it's by Jill Lepore. It's called These Truths. It just came out in November. And boy, the whole theme of it is how slavery uh, corrupted American life and still does today. 
uh, the compromises that were made to pacify the southern states uh, uh, just endure today and corrupt our politics today and a lot of our life, racism and everything else. But uh, if you want a wonderful read, that is a great book to, to follow into. Uh, so anyway, uh, here we are. We, we spread this idea across New England, and it, gets, uh, it takes a, a very firm root. But uh, the attempt to try to educate everyone is a noble democratic ideal, and uh, thank God we did it. You know, we got at it. Um, today's yardsticks, uh, do be careful how rigorously you apply them. Uh, for the times, they were usually the best that could be done. Uh, I mean, uh, some of the things that they had to do, we, we'd be appalled today, but uh, uh, by and large, uh, we just have to go with the idea that it was the best that could be done. These were hyper-local institutions, the district schools that sprang up. And there were so many of them. Norwich with 20, my town, Plainfield, 16, Haverhill, New Hampshire, 23. I mean, this sounds crazy, but here's why. How far could a little second grader be reasonably ex be expected to walk? No buses. Nobody's got time to uh, hook up a buggy and take a kid to school. So we build a school nearby mile and a half radius around the building. And then we go down the road and build another one, and over and over and over. And that's why they became so numerous. Uh, you know, all these absurd stories about people that walk to the one-room school 10 miles each way, uphill both ways, you know, all that. That's not true. Uh, they were like uh, Mrs. Bernard's class. They were intimate. They were experimental in many ways. And by today's standards, we'd say they're very terribly progressive. Uh, we, uh, we're amazed uh, that they worked, ungraded often. And then, a uh, very, very important thing is they served as community centers. And uh, particularly in the period that I'm talking about, they were terribly important as places for people to gather. Uh, they were more than school. There would be a place where you might have a wedding reception. You'd have a Christmas party. You'd bring neighbors together. And in that period that I'm talking about, it was critically important because the, the, the whole rural countryside of New England had plunged into a period of melancholy because of the tremendous exodus of population, the horrible exodus of population. I'm sure Norwich didn't hit, get hit quite as badly. If we went to Stratford, or we go over here to, to, to Plainfield, or, or Canaan, or any of these towns, and we just see after the Civil War, the agricultural prosperity of the early part of the 19th century just shrank and shriveled, and people packed up and went away. They went to work in the mills of the Merrimack Valley or down the Connecticut River, or they went west to farm in the Midwest or even to Oregon and California. And so uh, just tremendous loss of population. So the people who were left behind were, were, were shell-shocked, really. To see land cleared at enormous toil reverting to forest, going back to the Indians, as we say. You know, a person, say, in the 1880s could have touched the hand that cleared the hillside to see it going back to trees. It, it, it was, had a profound impact. So the idea of a place to get together, no TV, uh, no radio, no telephone, a place to come together. Schools afforded that opportunity. The Grange came along later in the 1890s and the beginning of the 20th century and fulfilled that function. And churches did too, but nothing like the, the one-room school uh, did in many, many locales. So anyway, let's roll on to uh, the reality. And again, <clears throat> I will say that uh, from today's perspective, we have to say it was kind of a hard row to make this all work. And... Uh, uh, it, it, I mean, today, some, a, lot of, a lot of what you find is, I mean, you shake your head and say, you can't believe it. But uh, let's start off with talking about leadership and governance. And um, it, this was true in New Hampshire and Vermont, and I presume in the other states as well. They seem to end, in, they kind of drift into a bifurcated form of governance for the, one, for the district school. And they would have a school board, or they called it the superintending school committee, 
And that, that uh, group, uh, that body, uh, often uh, was the selectmen. And then eventually the selectmen said, we don't really like doing this. We'll appoint a school board. And then later uh, the school board would be elected. Uh, but they would be in charge of, of hiring the teacher and supervising the curriculum and assessing, doing evaluation of how things were progressing in report to the, uh, to the taxpayers. And then there was a prudential committee. And the Prudential Committee had control of the money. And the Prudential Committee was the one that was responsible for fixing the roof, getting the wood supply, and setting, very often, setting the teacher's salary. So you had this going on. And very often, the, the Prudential Committee had all the power, really. And uh, um, sometimes the Prudential Committee would consist of one person. In Plainfield, I found one district that had one person who was the Prudential Committee, and he did it for about 46 years, as near as I can tell. And near as I can tell, he was a miserable bastard. <laughs> I found where he, a, a, a woman, uh, had, a, a, had a class, and she let the children go at the end of the term for a couple of hours early on the last day, and he docked her pay. Can you imagine? Uh, anyway. So, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, you get into the latter part of the 1880s and, um, uh, well, in New Hampshire, and it happened in, in a sort of somewhat different way in Vermont. Uh, the legislature finally said, get too many committees here. It's all confusing. Let's have one committee in charge of all the schools in each town. And there was a lot of pushback on that uh, in New Hampshire. They just said, hmm. Okay, well, you've got to try the new way for five years. At the end of five years, you can vote to go back to your old ways if you want. Well, none of them did. It took hold. One committee for the whole deal. Um, now, a very interesting thing along the way was this. And this happened in New Hampshire, and I cannot seem to get my fingers on exactly what happened in Vermont, but I'll bet it did. In 1885, the New Hampshire legislature said, Women can be uh, school board members, okay? And the town can elect school board members who are women. Now, that's a radical, radical concept. You think how far ahead of universal suffrage we are with that. In the town of Washington, New Hampshire, word got around after this took place, there was a woman that was going to run, Okay, you're going to run for school board. And they had the biggest turnout of it they ever had to make sure she didn't get elected. <laughs> but I did find two years later, by golly, she did get elected and she served for 10 to 12 years. And you get into the 1890s, you find women on school boards everywhere. And a lot of towns where they have two women out of three school board members, uh, they're women serving. So, you know, God bless them and finally they got it done. Now, in the background, of course, uh, was the Grange movement on so, a lot of these things, particularly with respect to education. And that's the thing that's really not appreciated about the Grange movement, what it accomplished in, in the northern part of the United States, and especially here in New England. Uh, the Grange got going really as a social organization, but as it got its membership up, it began to take a real interest in public uh, issues and would lobby, and, 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 and the, it was a potent force when uh, at its peak, it had probably one out of every eight or nine voters in, in the state, you know, in either state, was a member of the Grange. So he took a keen interest. Now the Grange, from the day of its organization, its founding, those birds up there on the wall, right up there with the big bushy mustaches, there were seven of them, mm -hmm. They took in women as equals in the movement. Uh, in the Grange, a woman can hold any office in the order from the get-go. And so I submit that a lot of the concern for education reform sponsored and advocated for successfully by the Grange movement traced to the fact that women were concerned about the welfare of children and their opportunities to be educated. And they pushed those issues and um, had a profound impact. So anyway, um, let's, uh, let's uh, kind of drift along here. Uh, <clears throat> enough about governance and, and all of that. Um, go ahead to uh, the biggest problem that, that just bedeviled um, the one <laughs> school district 
and it still bedevils us today, is the disparity in the tax base available to support the school. You could have a school in the, and, and, and all these one-room schools were separate uh, tax districts until modern times. And so <clears throat> you could have a school here in the village, had some wealth, had some stores, buildings, might be railroad property, whatever. They had some tax base support school. And then up on the mountain, there's a school that all they've got for tax bases is maybe a farm and some trees. And so the great disparity, and it shows up in, in many, many uh, towns, and this was all over New England, there'd be school districts that kept three terms, you know, they went to school for 20, 25 weeks a year, and up on the mountainside they had one term for five weeks, and that was it. They didn't have any more money. They couldn't do it. So this disparity would bedevil the school. Well, boy, I can't speak, well, I can speak for Vermont, but I'm not going to. But in New Hampshire, we're still bedeviled by that issue. And if you don't believe me, I'll take you to Claremont and you ride around. Then you come up to Lebanon and Hanover. Yeah. And you look at the school buildings. Unbelievable. And that's, that just goes way back, and it's still with us. Anyway, on let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about facilities. Was the fun part? These schools tended to be uh, uh, very uh, uh, almost uniform in the way they were conceived. Very simple. Okay, uh, of course they weren't insulated. Number one, uh, they uh, sometimes are done very cheaply, and sometimes they're done very very uh, good, sturdy, good, uh, adequate construction, excellent construction. And uh, <clears throat> they have to have a wood stove to keep warm, uh, uh, no insulation, had to have a privy, of course, and most had a bell to summon the children to class. Now, the interesting thing is I have yet to find a one-room schoolhouse that has a, a dug cellar under it, a real. Maybe somebody later on did something, but in, in the original concept, they were built on rough stone foundations, Okay. So you could put up a school quite quickly that way. You don't have to dig, you don't have to worry about frost walls or anything like we do today. And so that gives rise to a very interesting phenomenon of these schools. They moved them around. A study was done in Lyme a few years ago. Lyme had 16 one-room schools, and the study tracked the, the disposition of those 16. Seven of them ended up at another location somewhere else. And so as population was declining in the more rural areas, often there weren't enough kids to bother to have a school. They say, well, the village school down in the town is kind of lame and needs, uh, we ought to build a new one. Nah, we'll take the good one up on the hillside, we'll pick it up, and we'll move it down here and set it up. Because they could move buildings, and they did it all the time. You know, hook up the oxen and pull them down the road. Uh, they didn't have to worry about power lines, you know, they could do that. <laughs> and I'll bet a lot of the barns and buildings around Norwich aren't where they originally stood, you know, they've been moved around. And the same with schools everywhere. Um, <clears throat> often the biggest facilities issue was the wood supply. And you're talking in this period, uh, an economy when there wasn't much cash available, there wasn't much cash in commerce. A lot of it was done by, life was uh, built around barter and trade. And uh, uh, so, chance to sell some wood for the school, you know, make, uh, sell a couple cords, six bucks maybe, uh, that looked pretty good. I even found one town where they broke it into three separate contracts to spread the money around. There was a contract to cut down the trees and cut the uh, wood into four foot lengths and dump it on the school grounds. And then the second contract was to cut it up to stove length and split it, dump it on the ground, and the third contract, gather it up and put it in the woodshed. So a jobs program, really. <clears throat> uh, another thing that's very interesting is the curriculum. Wherever you look, it's like they were all connected through the rock formations. It was pretty much the same curriculum wherever you go. Uh, just the basic core curriculum was almost identical. Because nobody in Concord, nobody in Montpelier saying, this is what you got to teach. They just said on their own, they figured it out. And so you'd have arithmetic, geography, grammar, penmanship, reading, spelling, history. That was the core curriculum. 
once in a while they might get fancy and uh, throw in a little philosophy or algebra. God help me, I didn't have to worry about that. But, <laughs> and then <laughs> one physiology. Although, in 1883, the New Hampshire legislature passed a law that said uh, all schools must uh, teach a class in physiology and hygiene with particular emphasis on study of the effects of alcohol and stimulants. Well, I was intrigued by that, and I had to dig around for quite a while, and I finally got to the bottom of it. It seems in 1883, the temperance movement convinced the New Hampshire legislature that there were 60,000 drunkards in the state. Well, you put it up against the net population of the state, they said about one in every seven persons in New Hampshire at that time was a drunkard. I mean, that's a lot of uh, alcohol abuse. Um, I don't know whether classes in the district schools had any impact on that, but at least they took a run at it. Uh, another interesting thing is very often students had to supply their own textbooks. Okay, well imagine, you know, grandpa had a book and gave it to his daughter and she used it in school and she gave it to her daughter. Imagine teaching class where all kids have different textbooks in the same subject. Uh, eventually uh, became pretty much consensus that we'll have the district buy the textbooks and so everybody will be on the same page. Um, school committees took very seriously their evaluation responsibility and would come in and visit class and sit in the classroom and observe and uh, write up these, uh, these reports to put in the annual report to become part of the records of the community. Uh, oftentimes they'd be quite favorable, other times it'd be horrible, you know, just devastating, criticizing the poor teacher, or the, the, the facilities are inadequate, so on and on and on. Uh, but uh, what, one that particularly intrigues me is this. It was called the public examination. And it was practiced quite widely. Uh, and it, basically what would happen towards the end of the school year would say, uh, they put out a call, we're going to have the public examination on such and such day. So everybody in the community would come in to the classroom and stand around the perimeter while the children were called upon to recite. All right? So they might say to a little fourth grade girl, go to the board and do times four, or ask a boy to recite the capitals of the New England states. And then they would sit down, and then there'd be discussion among all the people standing about, and recommendations offered to the teacher about who should advance and who should be held back. They might say, William Aldrich is very, very yeah. slow, and he should repeat fourth grade. But uh, J. Van Arman, he's a genius, and he can skip the fifth grade, you know. <laughs> Just think of it, you know. Uh, <laughs> ha! Yeah, I love it. Anyway, okay, uh, the teaching profession. If there's a unifying characteristic throughout, it was continuous turnover of teachers. Uh, very little stability, very little tenure, really, uh, where they would be around for a while. Uh, a, a teacher like Eva Hill Bernard uh, is pretty rare, really. Uh, um, the, the profession characterized by low pay, and uh, the women uh, totally abused. They, if they were lucky, they'd get two-thirds of what they would pay a man teacher. And again, my friend who, who, who docked the poor teacher at the end of the term, um, he was in charge of a school where there were 46 pupils in the charge of this one female teacher. And she got $15 a month. And there was a man who had a, a, a school in another part of the town. He only had 12 pupils, and he got $19 a month. I mean, this was very, very widespread. Thirds for females uh, versus what the men got. Um, many of these teachers were as young as 15 years of age. Very common for a girl who was successful in the eighth grade, did a decent, uh, was, uh, showed promise, would be invited to be a teacher the following year, and she'd be handed a classroom full of kids. Uh, um, about an average age for a female teacher was about 19. And uh, uh, 
uh, around here, it's interesting, I found uh, quite often a Dartmouth student would take a term off and teach in a one-room district school, to, I assume, to get a little money ahead, and then return to studies back at, uh, at the college. Um, another feature of uh, teaching was a practice called board around. Many of these, most of these teachers came from somewhere else. They didn't come from the immediate district where they were going to be teaching. They would need a place to live, a place to stay, to get meals. And so the school board would call for bids. Who will put up the teacher for the least amount of money uh, uh, in their home and feed her or him? And so people put in a bid. Might say uh, $3 a week. Okay, good. And so the teacher would be assigned to that particular farm, usually a farm, and they would stay there and teach. And the town or the school district uh, would pay the farm to put them up. And I found a wonderful monograph, or a memoir, uh, by a woman who talked about being placed on a farm under board around, and uh, her host family locked up the food whenever they left the premises and she was still there. So she wouldn't snack between meals uh, and, uh, and, and cost more than the agreed amount of care. And so anyway, another way they, they held uh, the teachers in bondage was to not to pay them until the end of the term. Well, if the term was, say, 10 weeks, and you went and you taught for your 10 weeks, then that's what you had to look forward to. And you kind of bound you there to stay on the job, no matter how bad it was, or whatever, uh, you, would, uh, you would hang in and, until you uh, term, uh, completed the term and then you finally get paid. New, uh, listen to this, this is curl your hair, I'm sure. Um, New Hampshire law first recognized female teachers in 1808, and it said in the law, their accepted moral inferiority is noted. Will you? Well, you listen. Oh my God! Uh, and 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 they 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 could teach only letters in the English language, reading, writing, and grammar. Uh, 1827. I said, well, okay, I guess they can teach arithmetic. Finally, in 18, 1858, New Hampshire law says all teachers are held equal under the law. Well, they're equal in what they had to do, but not in pay. Certainly. Anyway, assessments of the abilities of our teachers. Printed in, in their fa abilities and failures, printed in town reports for all to see, become a per permanent record. Teachers had to keep these buildings warm. That, was, that occupied an awful lot of their time. Imagine you got some green wood and you're trying to keep a classroom warm. Oh, my God. Uh, and one teacher, <laughs> she said, when scholars have to use all of their mental faculties in devising methods to keep warm, it should not be expected that they're going to learn much from their books. Uh, I'll bet. you got earmuffs on and mittens. They're going to lead around that. To give you an idea of the churn of teachers going through, again, I go back to my, my hometown, Plainfield. In 1885, there were uh, 16 uh, uh, schools in town, all right? And so if we had three terms a year, theoretically there would have been 48 terms of school kept in the town. But in reality, there were only 32. So a lot of the schools that just didn't bother to keep a term during the winter, just the hell with it, all right? But of those 32 terms held, there were 25 different teachers. So, you know, just they're, they're churning through all the time. And only 11 of those 25 were residents of the town. They had come in from somewhere else. You see, you know, if a girl's 15 years old and she's asked to teach in district number six and she lives in district number six, she says, oh, boy, I, I know those Van Nyman kids. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to go there. I'll go over to the next district over the hill. Anyway, now teachers were plagued with the problem of irregular attendance disease being rampant, the childhood diseases all the time, you know, scarlet, fever, mumps, measles, whooping cough, on and on and on, and then you had the chronic problem of, of uh, um, you know, digestive problems, you know, they had no idea of, about microbiology and, and good sanitation of water and, and milk and everything, and so 
you might have, they used to call it the epizootic. Today we call it the stomach bug. But it would go through a school, everybody would have it. They just shut down school for a couple of weeks and people got uh, back to good health. Uh, so that was a, a wicked problem. And then, of course, they had far more serious diseases that they were, were always lurking. Uh, of course, polio uh, and then uh, uh, tuberculosis, they called it consumption. That was a big issue. And one we never hear about today, uh, we call it undulant fever in humans and cows. It's called brucellosis. It comes from diseased cows infecting raw milk, people consuming it. It's a neuroskeletal disease. If it doesn't kill you, it leaves you deformed, crippled. Um, and then uh, another issue uh, in terms of irregular attendance would have been the failure of parents make the kids go to school. Uh, and this would be uh, prob mostly an expression of the rural culture. Um, let's say it's September, the corn is ready to harvest. We'll keep the boys home to help with cutting the corn and getting it in the corn crib or whatever. Or there's a new baby in the house. We'll keep sister home to churn butter and bake bread and wash the overalls while mom cares for this new infant. And so teachers will just be confronted all the time. Who's going to show up today? Uh, and for how long will they be out? So that was that made it tough. Uh, anyway, discipline, uh, great variation. Some of the old records are rather hilarious, and, but you can say there were classrooms where teachers ruled with an iron fist or an 18-inch uh, hardwood ruler, I assume. Uh, others were absolutely chaotic. Washington, New Hampshire, they had a 15-year-old teacher and she had a bunch of 16-year-old boys, and if they refused, didn't want to obey, they might grab her and throw her out the window of the classroom. This is documented in the town history. That's the word defenestration, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway, the visitation reports that would, would be printed would very often dwell on, on the behavior and the atmosphere in the room. So anyway... We get towards uh, World War I, and these rough edges begin to get kind of uh, ground down and smoothed out a little bit, uh, and, and things begin to change, uh, and they would, it would accelerate. But some of the things that happened early in the 20th century, uh, number one was the creation of the position of school superintendent. And the original purpose of the school superintendent was to ride from school to school to school to help these young teachers master the ideas of, uh, of maintaining order, preparing curriculum, uh, effective teaching, and these kinds of things. That's how we got school superintendents. It was the same in Vermont. It was the same everywhere. Um, you know, now the school superintendent is a vastly powerful position uh, with huge responsibilities. Uh, we began as, as the, with the coming of motorized transportation, the improvement of highways, and the shrinking of population. We began closing schools and consolidating and adapting to the idea of multiple classroom buildings with all the classes taught in an individual classroom grade by grade. And that idea began to catch on, and uh, you saw people moving children with trucks or still with horse and buggy often, moving them from the hillsides into uh, a, what they call consolidated schools. That began right at, at the turn of the 20th century and then it began to accelerate everywhere. So uh, the, the district schools began to shrink and, and disappear at an accelerating rate uh, by the time of World War I. And then came the idea of better teacher preparation uh, preparing teachers uh, uh, to be professionals uh, through education. And uh, we adopted uh, the French uh, uh, strategy uh, and it gave rise to what we call normal schools. I was always, I never said, why are they called normal schools? Are they otherwise abnormal? <laughs> no, it goes to, to France where in the 1870s, they began a, a program called École Normale, where all prospective teachers would be brought together and taught the classroom methods 
as well as the content, you know, the, the subject material that they were going to be teaching. And then that idea was adopted here in the United States and gave rise to places like uh, Linden Normal School, Plymouth Normal School, Keene Normal School, to prepare teachers to go forth and, 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 uh, and conduct classroom with a measure of training and, and, and confidence that they could succeed. And so that was a very, very important thing. So, um, uh, so there were just all these accelerating forces bringing about the consolidation and the closure of the district schools one by one, town by town, everywhere in New England. I'll wrap this up here to assess the, the one-room school in the context of the times, uh, the, uh, most of all the declining population, and uh, how that sort of pressured the, 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 the movement to, to, to just get rid of the one-room school, to, to shut them down, and to get a, a consolidated school or serve a whole town. Um, the declining population is just staggering. My town of Plainfield, from 1860 to 1890, lost 30% of its population and 40% of its tax base. People just left and went away and abandoned farms. That vast game preserve occasion you hear about that's in Plainfield and Grantham and Croydon down in that area, that mountain range, that was all assembled for pennies an acre by, out of abandoned farms. Just Austin Corbin was a robber baron, and he wanted to have a game preserve, and he just went around and bought up all this land. The towns were happy to have somebody buy it. A lot of the towns were just carrying this land on inventory. Nobody wanted it. And so he put together this vast game preserve with, uh, with that kind of land. Um, and this, this happened in, in, uh, in it's expressed itself in many different ways. But uh, the declining population, there was no agricultural prosperity to take over what had existed in the first half of the 19th century. You realize, if you took the sheep population of Norwich and Hanover and Hartford and Lebanon, it would total almost 50,000 sheep in 1835. That's more sheep than are in all of New England today. I mean, Norwich had 10,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep, I'm telling you. Hanover had almost 13,000. If I showed up with a trailer truck loaded with 100 sheep at the town line in Hanover, how many police cruisers would be meeting? <laughs> anyway, um, so the declining population was just forcing this. Um, there was a lot of conflict in, in the community about the value of education, per se. There were a lot of people who thought, geez, you know, uh, teach my kid to, to read and write and do simple arithmetic. That's, that's all he needs. He's going to come back on the farm. And I and my brothers and uncles and grandpa, we're going to teach him how to build a fence or how to uh, move cows around, how to cut corn, do those kinds of things. Or my daughter, uh, she, can, she can benefit from some education. But basically, her mom and her aunts and her sisters and the, the community will teach her how to keep house and how to tend babies and do all of that. And we don't really need an elaborate educational assist system. But then there were other people who said, times are changing. Industrialization is changing the world. We need to prepare our children better. So you had that tension. We still have a little of it today. You know, and, oh, God, that school's good enough for me. I don't see why we need to build an addition. You know, all that. That goes on. Conflicting attitudes. I talked enough about treatment of women. And then finally, <coughs> fairly widespread disagreement, and it still exists. Uh, Act 46 in Vermont is a perfect manifestation of it, uh, the conflict about the small school versus the big school. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, as these one-room schools were under imminent threat of closure, said, oh, wait a minute, I love that school. I can get my arms around it. I know all the parents. The kids know everybody from growing up with them. Uh, th that's a value. That's good. Let's keep that. And other people said, yeah, well, they'd be better off if they went to school and they had a second grade classroom where the teacher was just doing second grade and, uh, and they would advance faster and, and obtain a better education. So, you know, we still have it today. We're still battling over it. Uh, the textbook example in New Hampshire was uh, the formation of the Kearsarge Regional School District. 
and it was in the 19, early 1970s, um, you had eight or nine towns around New London, and all said, boy, we'll shut down these little small high schools, and we'll have one big one, and this will be good for everybody. Everybody said, well, yeah, this is good. Everybody's kind of going along, except Sunapee. Some said, nope, we're going to keep our own school. So Kearsarge Regional High School now graduates 150, 170 kids a year. Sunapee High School graduates 28. Sunapee's happy. This is, this is the way we want it. This is the way we're going to keep it. Well, in Vermont, you know, Act 46 is kind of kind of putting that on the run. They you White River Valley. They closed, what, four high schools, and now you got one. And so that's all going on. You know, a lot of people grieve about the loss. They, or the Today's Valley News article about the two kids who played basketball at well, Chelsea, now they're at Thetford, you know, just like the NBA, you know, they move around. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, you know, people have, you know, real deep commitment in their hearts to, uh, uh, to the one-room school. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up with a little anecdote. Uh, <laughs> I was going around New Hampshire doing this talk, and people would always say, well, are there any one-room schools left in New Hampshire? Yes, there are two, I would say, two. There's one in Croydon, down north of Newport, and it's called the Red School because it's brick. It is a K through three today. Uh, it purports to be the oldest continuously functioning one-room school in America, dating to 1794. Now, that's the Red School, okay? Well, up in uh, Landaff, up by Littleton, is a wooden school that they call the Blue School. It's, well, it's more like a Kelly blue. It's a little bluer than this uh, Wayne's coating here. Anyway, that's the blue school. So I said, oh, we got a red school, we got a blue school. Well, people in Croydon said, eh, eh, eh. That school up in Landaff, that's not a one-room school. And what do you mean? They said it's got a portable classroom hooked onto it, so it's a two-room school, all right? <laughs> oh, well. Two summers ago, I drove by the Red School, uh, and out of the corner of my eye, I think I saw a portable classroom. <laughs> I called up Mrs. McDonough, who knows everything about Croydon. I said, see here, what's the story? No, 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 it's not connected. <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, footnote to all of that was I went to New Hampton, and I told that story, and they said, hey, you're wrong, Sonny. We got a functioning one-room school right here. In the 1940s, they built a consolidated school next door to a little one-room school building. And they said, ha, let's keep that school, and it still functions. It's the fourth grade classroom. So there you go. Well, OK, thanks for your attention. Anybody have a comment or question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're good. You all set? Um, Good. You want to take a couple of questions? Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Sure. Are there questions from the school? Mm -hmm. Anybody have a question? Well, show of hands. How many went to a one-room school ever? Anybody? Ah, look at that one. Beautiful. Two. Great. Anybody ever teach in one? No. All right. Go ahead. Um, if there aren't any questions, I just uh, Sarah, I want you to uh, mention um, that we are uh, in the process of working up an exhibit on schooling in Norwich. Uh, which we're going to install end of February, early March, somewhere in there. Um, that will be up all year long, so um, we invite folks to come in and, um, and see what we've done. Um, I know that we're going to have uh, sort of a hands-on school room as part of the exhibit. Uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, sort of a timeline of the history of schooling in Norwich. Uh, we're going to have one of the parlors devoted to uh, when Norwich University was in the town of Norwich. Hmm. Hmm. So from its foundings in 1819, this is the bicentennial year of Norwich University, 1819 up to 1866 when the South Barracks burned and the school relocated up to Northfield. And what am I forgetting? Um, a piece on the district schools. The district schools, yeah. 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 So we will, the exhibit will uh, illuminate many of the dimensions of, of uh, schooling that Steve was talking about um, and show us what was going on here in Rome. Good. Question. Hi, I'm Barbara Files. I'm on the Hanover Historical Society board. And I own a schoolhouse ah. in the remotest part of Hanover. Uh, was in service 1822 to 1921. 
and everything you said resonates with what I have found in our town records. Yeah. So we are hoping to do a joint program during your year of education with you out at the Tunis District School on the east side of Moose Mountain. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's right. we, keep, we keep it open. It's a just small private museum that my husband mm -hmm. and I take care of. And so um, once the roads are passable and you can get through the crusty mm -hmm. snow, all year round, you can let yourself in and check it out. That's wonderful. And, and we've, I've seen that around in both states. Uh, I guess what the, the preservationists call adaptive reuse. Um, some of them become residences. If they still stand, they become residences. Others have become little libraries or town offices or museums, uh, which is wonderful that, that, you know, finally here and, you know, 100 years later, really, uh, uh, we're, we're saying, hey, you know, there's some value there. Let's preserve it. That's important. It's a miracle it's wood yes. that it's still standing. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. my husband and I received the New Hampshire Preservation Award for our work out there, mm -hmm. and they called it a revitalization yes. because they were so poor they didn't have uh, cameras, yeah. and they didn't make daily records, so we right. don't really know what it was like. Yeah. But Shea Barrett helped us to do the research as we gently took yeah. it apart. And so we put it back together. Wonderful. Gee, that's great. Do you, do you have kids from uh, the Ray School come out and visit? We haven't had that. We've had a number of programs, but I was telling Sarah, we have a fan base like crazy. Uh, people regularly come out there. We invite them to bring lunch and sit in the school, um, outside the school. There's a cemetery across the road that um, when you compare the town records to some of the the gravestones there are a match. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also have an 1811 house up there that we brought back. And um, it makes a nice triad to really understand what life was like out in these spots, mm -hmm. the sheep farms. It's terrific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good so show. Um, most of you know, we have two schoolhouses in, in uh, Norwich that are preserved. And the Root Schoolhouse will be up and running as a community center and hopefully an educational center by September. But just to say, if you don't know that, there's Beaver Meadow and the Root Schoolhouse, which is out on Goodrich Four Corners. And Goodrich Four Corners has been nominated for a um, village uh, historic area like Norwich is. Mm -hmm. but Wonderful. It's been nominated as a district, a district. historic district. Mm -hmm. Great. Jay, I think yeah. you want I was to just say a quick uh, story about the Root District. Uh, uh, Eddie Botwell was a school marm up there, and Pete Powers was an alumnus, and he was saying that one of his uh, classmates wasn't singing, and Eddie came across his fingers with an 18-inch pointer, and he sang a canary after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Very good. Steve okay. I'm curious, when, how did you get from Plainfield to Hanover High School in 1945? Uh, well, no, no. Uh, 52. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, in the 50s, Plainfield has school choice. And in the western part of the township, the kids tended to go to Windsor. Uh, some would go to Lebanon. There was a high school in West Lebanon that had a, an Aggie program. Some would go there. So basically, go uh, you go wherever you could get a ride. And I had a neighbor that uh, he worked at Hunter Architects in Hanover, and he said, "Ah, come on, you can ride with me." But if I wanted to play sports, it was uh, until I got my license. It was kind of a challenge. I used to hitchhike. You could always get a ride from Hanover to West Lebanon just like that. But then I'd have to walk down to West Lebanon Village down to where the Mascoma River is, and there would be times it would be a half an hour before a single car would come by. This is 12A, and uh, they felt, of course they were probably going to play field. Felt sorry for me, give me a ride, and so I'd get home. But that was the way it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank well, you so much. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Please, please join us downstairs for refreshments. Mm -hmm. Great.